Welcome to worship at the United Church of Fayetteville on this overcast Sunday in October. It is good to be here with folks who are present and who are um, worshiping with us virtually. We're also glad to have Dave back with us, who has not been able to be with us for a while, and he did come to vote me out of office, and I appreciate that. Um, but it is good to have you here. We're really glad that you made it today. Um, now, I would like to invite forward the, the uh, student project leaders from the Universe Newhouse School client public relations campaign class to talk to uh, introduce themselves and talk to us a little bit about what they're doing with their project. Hello, my name is Emma. And I'm Elizabeth. And we're senior public relations majors at Newhouse at Syracuse University. Um, we're a part of our campaigns class. We're a part of a larger team of eight. This class is something, it's our capstone. It's something we have to take before we graduate in the spring. And the point of the class is to kind of execute a full campaign, get some real world experience before we go get jobs. So this year our client is you guys, the United Church of Fayetteville. So we're doing some media-based work for you guys. We're working on the website a little bit, which is super fun, um, which is why you've seen us taking pictures the past couple nights. We're trying to get some more content other than what we've been given by everybody. So I guess as far as we don't need too much from you guys, but if you have any input on anything you'd like to see as far as social media or anything that you think would be of value for us to know, let Linda or anybody else know and they can relay it back to us. But thank you for hosting us. And you can also send that input to Dave DeHorty and Janet Press who are liaisons with the class. And now we welcome Beth Krause for a minute for ministry. Good morning. Well, as you guessed, this is an important time in the life here at UF, UCF. It's a time for us to envision what our new chapter is going to look like, feel like. It's a bit scary, uncomfortable, change can be, but it's also a time of incredible excitement. Well thought out change does not happen overnight. It is prayerful, it is thoughtful, and it is deliberate. These steps all take time. And as some of us might say, time is money. As we prayerfully discern our pledges for our next year, consider this. We will be hiring a transitional pastor. We have been told to anticipate that the salary should be commensurate with our current salary amounts. Employing a new pastor is never, ever a cost-saving event. We need to look financially attractive to appeal to the type of candidates that can effectively <clears throat> shepherd us through our transition period and beyond. We are also so very fortunate to have a fantastic, dedicated staff who, we'll, who we will continue sorry, to compensate. Your financial contributions to UCF keep our home, our staff, and our programs thriving. While your pledge is extremely important, your contribution of time is as well. As we enter our next chapter, there will be so many ways that your ideas, help, participation will be needed. When the call goes out, please answer it because UCF's future depends on you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
People of God, each week we gather to celebrate the gifts of God who has called us into this community of people and of worship. We raise our voices in praise for the beauty of the life we have been given as together we worship the Lord. I think I'm on the same page now. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Amazing God, the gifts you bestow on us are too numerous to name, yet our gratitude demands we try. We are grateful for our time of worship and focus on you that restores our awareness of all that we have mm -hmm. and from whom it comes. We are glad for your spirit, which empowers our joy and our generous spirits in your image. Accept our thanksgiving for the blessings, gifts, and call of this life of discipleship. Amen. Brothers and sisters, filled with the bounty of God, let us make room within to receive one more good gift, that of forgiveness. Let us make our confession together. Merciful God, we often say to others, God has been good to us, but too often we forget to say it to you. We speak of counting our blessings, but too often we only tally our woes. Forgive us by the power of your spirit. 
help us to truly express in word and in deed the depth and height of our gratitude. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God hears our prayers and responds. Through Christ, we are forgiven. And because of that gift, we are empowered to live graceful as a graceful, gracious people. Having received this great gift, let us make our offerings of thanksgiving and praise. Please join me in prayer. Wondrous God, we strive this day to fully express our gratitude, recognizing all that you have given us. We make our offerings from this treasure store, 
so that your glory may be known in the world through our praise, our thankfulness, and our service. May all these things be pleasing to you, and may we direct their use according to your purposes. In Christ's name, we serve and we pray. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture today comes from the psalmist and are a few passages from Psalm 100. Let us listen for God's word for us today. The psalmist writes, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So wrote the psalmist. Let us join in the psalmist praise and give thanks for God's enduring word. God's word to us continues from the first letter of Peter. Let us listen together. Peter writes, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To God belongs the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. God always blesses the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living of the Holy Word. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, gift us with your spirit that it blows through your word and into us, informing our understanding and our service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The printer printed everything back to back, which isn't typical, sorry. Feeling awful. Spell check still wants to change the spelling of the meditation title, and I did warn everyone who prepares bulletins, slides, etc., that it was not a typo. Not that my typing ever includes errors, but it always pays to be safe. <laughs> Our title harkens back to the early meaning of the word awful, and the one most frequently used in scripture. Not to feel sick or scared, but to be filled with awe with wonder at something outside ourselves, something that gives us a sense of our place in the universe and perspective on our role and power. For a number of years, we have been celebrating this Gratitude Sunday in the run-up to Stewardship Dedication Sunday. This is based on our theology that reminds us that we make our offerings and serve, not out of guilt or fear, but out of gratitude for all that we have received. If we are to honestly consider what we offer to God's service, we must first thoughtfully and prayerfully remember all that we have received. For as Eckhart Tolle wrote, it is through gratitude 
for the present moment that the spiritual dimension of life opens up and we are all about the spiritual dimension of life. Just like awe, gratitude does not come easily. It is learned, it is not inborn. I have never had a parent tell me that their child's first words were, thank you. <laughs> we learn gratitude by expressing thanks and watching people express thanks in various ways. The outward expression of the inward feeling of gratitude. Our children and grandchildren will learn it from seeing us, not and by seeing our practices of appreciation, worship, thanksgiving, and offering. Okay. I'm reminded of an occasion that happened many years ago now. I was having dinner with friends who were active in the church, not this one, apparently quite financially comfortable, and insofar as I know, generous. They had just updated their wills to be sure that their only child was taken care of should anything happen to both of them. Then they mentioned that they had made no charitable bequests or memorial gifts because they wanted their child to have the joy of giving money to things they were passionate about. In the course of this conversation, they also stated that they did not discuss with their child any of their current charitable efforts for the same reason. Now, before I continue with this, please note several things. These people were good friends for whom I had and still have the highest regard. I did not initiate this conversation or make what I would consider to be intrusive inquiries. This was all volunteered. It is never my place to comment on someone's financial planning or parenting, and I am not doing that now. What I am doing is offering that experience as an illustration. As I said, Gratitude is not an inborn trait, nor is the inclination to sharing. If we hide our witness to God's giving to us, to our gratitude, to our values, to our sharing of ourselves and our treasure, especially but not solely to our children and grandchildren, how will they learn the joy of those things and the fulfillment of com that comes from sharing? How will our community know that our congregation's giving and sharing is based in gratitude and not fear of an angry God whom we do not proclaim here, or simple condescension to those who do not have what we have? We need to publicly witness to what we have and what we do. Nor is gratitude a feeling that can be evoked on command. One can't just say, be grateful, and people are grateful. Ask any parent who has ever uttered the words, you should be grateful that you, if the instruction ever invoked more than an eye roll. A preacher can't just say, be grateful, and face a people overwhelmed with gratitude. In my professional circles, it is often commented that ours is an exceedingly different, difficult country and era in which to preach gratitude a country where we pride ourselves on being self-made, when we have historically been a nation whose legacy is that people can make anything of themselves here, where we have really lost a sense of on whose shoulders we stand, of whose choices, sacrifices, and resources made possible for us to do what we do. If we have forgotten all that we have received because of the access we have to resources, to, for others in our families, our congregation, from others in our families, our congregation, our cities, or our nation have made available to us, G.K. Chesterton would remind us, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. No, gratitude isn't a natural thing, and it isn't a thinking thing either. It is an attitude that comes through spiritual practice and attention to our world. It's not an easy thing. It takes discipline and practice and practice and practice. Gratitude is a hard attitude to achieve and maintain. Whether it is in a spot interview on the street or a personal conversation or maybe a casual conversation in fellowship hall or 
the traditional prayer at the Thanksgiving tables around which we will soon gather. After the big three of family, friends, and health, people usually run out of steam. I know there are some of you who are now naming a few other things to yourselves, which is excellent, and if I were here after the benediction, I would love to hear them. If this message had homework, and they all do, you know that, but assigned homework, I challenge folks to write the longest list they can for things to be thankful for, beginning with, the sun came up this morning and so did I. We could have an informal contest. Who can write the longest list? Gratitude isn't an easy spiritual practice. It is one that bears fruit for rich and joyful lives. Acknowledging that we have received much does not denigrate our own achievements and need not lessen our sense of accomplishment about how we have responsibly used what we have received. Rather, gratitude can help us keep our lives in perspective. It can serve to reassure us that we are not alone and that all does not depend on us. There is an ancient proverb, not from our scriptures, which says, when you are grateful, fear disappears and abundance appears. Gratitude can serve the very practical purpose of lowering our stress levels and reducing our anxieties, especially in times of change and uncertainty. Then may it be for us, as Henry Nouwen wrote, perhaps nothing helps us make the movement from our little, little selves to a larger world than remembering God in gratitude. Such a perspective puts God in view in all of life, not just in the moments we set aside for worship or spiritual practices, not just in the moments when life seems easy. As we go forth this week, with thanks on our lips and in our minds, may our practice of gratitude be strengthened and enhanced for our sakes and for the sake of the whole world for which Christ died. Realizing that we are rich in things that have cost us no money, as we anticipate making our financial commitments to Christ's service in this place, let us remember that as much has been given to us, much will be expected from us and that true homage comes from the heart as well as from the lips, and it shows itself in deeds. Teddy Roosevelt's words are as true today as they were the day he first uttered them.
Let us be gathered in prayer. Compassionate God, gift us with your spirit in these moments as we seek your guidance and purpose for our lives, ministry, and world. We remember those who are ill, who are grieving, who are caregivers, and all who need care. We especially remember those with whom we are in strained relationship. Grant us your vision of their gifts and goodness, as well as our own. Give us your wisdom to see the way that we should go for the healing of hearts, souls, minds, and relationships. Most holy God, we have no words to express our horror at the events in Israel and the Gaza Strip. We pray for all those families who have lost loved ones and homes, for those who are held hostage, and all the families who do not know the fate of their loved ones, for armed combatants, that they may serve with honor and find reason to lay down their weapons under wise leadership for first responders struggling to provide care, for humanitarian workers in every role. Nor do we forget the ongoing carnage in Ukraine. Our own grief is compounded by our government's current uncertainty in process and effectiveness that limit our nation's ability to respond. We pray for our leaders and for all the leaders around the world, that they might make working together for peace and justice a first priority. We cry, peace, peace, in a world where there is no peace. Now we stop our words, that we might feel your presence, hear your word, and be filled with compassion and hope so that we might respond in faithful ways to the world that so desperately needs us. We are listening, Lord.
Lord, bless our listening and our responding. As we pray with silent meditations, and as we are bold to pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. And let all God's people say, 